Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. This is different and in many ways unpleasant having to hold this thing. But I lost my voice this week. It's coming back. But now you can hear me. This, this, is, this is fitting for the Reformation. If I wasn't using this thing, it would be as if I was up at the altar whispering the service and you're all just sitting there thinking, oh, this is fun. But this way you can actually hear me preaching to you, reading the Bible to you, leading you in prayers. Now, because it's Reformation Sunday, today we're going to be using the chorale service, which is an especially Lutheran way of worshiping. And if you want to know more about that, you can just take a peek at the back explanation. And we'll begin this morning with the first hymn. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. From the heart, let us confess our sins unto God. O Lord our God, we come before you as poor sinful beings, and are without excuse in that we have sinned against you by thought, word, and deed. But we believe in your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, who has suffered for our salvation. And for his sake, we pray you, forgive us all our sins. Grant us your Holy Spirit, 
to the end that we may believe your pardoning word, and according to the purpose and desire of our hearts, may flee all sin, and let your holy and blessed will rule in all things. Lord, have mercy upon us. Amen. Upon this your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God to all of you. And in the stead, and by the command of our Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. May he comfort your heart by his holy absolution, and strengthen you by his sacraments, that your joy may be full. Peace be with you. Amen. We sing the next hymn.
Please rise. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we most heartily thank you that by your grace, you have brought us out of the darkness of error into the light of your grace. We pray you, mercifully help us to walk in that light, guard us from all error and false doctrine, and grant that we may not become ungrateful and despise and persecute your word, but receive it with all our heart, govern our lives according to it, and put all our trust in your grace, through the merit of your dear Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one true God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. <coughs> the Old Testament reading is from 2 Chronicles chapter 29, verses 3 through 11, and verses 15 through 19. In the first year of his reign, in the first month, he opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. He brought in the priests and the Levites and assembled them in the square on the east and said to them, Hear me, Levites, now consecrate yourselves and consecrate the house of the Lord, the God of your fathers, and carry out the filth from the holy place. For our fathers have been unfaithful and have done what was evil in the sight of the Lord our God. They have forsaken him and have turned away their faces from the habitation of the Lord and turned their backs. They also shut the doors of the vestibule and put out the lamps and have not burned incense or offered burnt offerings in the holy place to the God of Israel. Therefore, the wrath of the Lord came on Judah and Jerusalem, and he has made them an object of horror, of astonishment, and of hissing, as you see with your own eyes. For behold, our fathers have fallen by the sword, and our sons and our daughters and our wives are in captivity for this. Now it is in my heart to make a covenant with the Lord, the God of Israel, in order that his fierce anger may turn away from us. My sons, do not now be negligent, for the Lord has chosen you to stand in his presence, to minister to him and to be his ministers and make offerings to him. Then the Levites arose and consecrated themselves and went in as the king had commanded by the words of the Lord to cleanse the house of the Lord. The priests went into the inner part of the house of the Lord to cleanse it, and they brought out all the uncleanness that they found in the temple of the Lord in the court of the house of the Lord. And the Levites took it and carried it out to the brook Kidron. They began to consecrate on the first day of the first month. And on the eighth day of the month, they came to the vestibule of the Lord. Then for eight days, they consecrated the house of the Lord. And on the sixteenth day of the first month, they finished. Then they went into Hezekiah the king and said, We have cleansed all the house of the Lord, the altar of burnt offerings, and all its utensils, and the table for the showbread, and all its utensils. All the utensils that King Ahaz discarded in his reign when he was faithless, we have made ready and consecrated, and behold, they are before the altar of the Lord. Here ends the Old Testament reading. We sing the next hymn.
The epistle reading is from Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 and 7. Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead, with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Here ends the epistle. We now sing the chief hymn.
rise to the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel for Reformation Sunday is from the 8th chapter of the Gospel according to St. John, verses 31 through 36. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham, and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Here ends the reading of the Holy Gospel. You may be seated as we sing the creedal hymn.
Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Growing up as a Lutheran in other parts of the country, I would occasionally hear people talking about how Martin Luther had restored the Christian church. I would also hear people talking about how Martin Luther had reformed the Christian church. When I was a kid, restore and reform, to use in that context, sounded the same to me. But as I got older and I became more advanced in school, and especially in the study of history and theology, I came to understand that we really should not talk about the restoring work of Martin Luther. Webster's Dictionary defines the word reform to amend or improve by change of form or removal of faults or abuses. It defines the word restore to put or bring back into existence or use. Now, of course, we don't do theology on the basis of Webster's Dictionary, but we do want to speak correctly. And in the English language, the true meaning of the Lutheran Reformation cannot be contained by the word restoration. At no time has God's church on earth needed to be restored, but God's church does always need to be reformed. We here in Utah, I don't think, would ever speak of a Lutheran restoration. Now that isn't because we are so much better at English than Lutherans in Massachusetts and Michigan and Minnesota are. The reason why we would never talk about a Lutheran restoration is because we know what the word restoration means in the context of Mormonism. The Mormon church teaches that God's true church on earth had completely disappeared, and it had to be brought back into existence through the work of Joseph Smith, the man whom God chose, calling him directly apart from the Bible, to restore the true church and all of its teachings. It isn't just Mormons who believe in a restoration. Jehovah's Witnesses also believe that in the time before the life of Charles Taze Russell, who lived and worked in the late 1800s, that the true Church of God had disappeared. But through the work and teachings of Russell, the true Church was restored. Now, in talking to both Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses, they have assumed that we have essentially the same view of Martin Luther as they have of Joseph Smith and Charles Russell, respectively. But we absolutely don't. As Lutherans, we don't believe that Martin Luther is the prophet of our church. We do not believe that God ever called Luther directly to do what we did, to do what he did. And Luther also never claimed that that happened. Luther had been called to be a pastor and teacher in the church in the same way that I and other pastors today have been called. But to reform the church, Luther was only called by God through his word, the Bible. God called Luther through his word to reform the teachings and life of the Christian church back to what God's word says in all its truth. God called Luther in light of what God's word promises about itself. At his ascension, in connection with the command to go and make disciples of all nations by the preaching of the word and the administration of the sacraments. Jesus promised his disciples that he would always be with them. The immediate context of that promise explains it to us. Jesus wasn't promising his disciples that he would always be with them in the sense that he is the God who fills all things. Jesus was promising specifically to be with his disciples, and by connection, the whole Christian church, through the word and sacraments that he had just told them to use. And Jesus did not promise them that he would be with them and with his church for a time, but that he would be with them until the end of the age, until Jesus returns. We heard this reflected in today's epistle reading from Revelation chapter 14. Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead, with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. Many people have, understand the, have understood that verse 
to actually be predicting the person and work of Martin Luther. That is why that verse is the appointed epistle reading for Reformation. But whether or not it really is pointing to Luther is neither here nor there. The important thing for us about that verse is how it describes the gospel that is proclaimed to every nation and tribe and people and language. It is eternal. And then, long before the earth and life of Christ, the prophet Isaiah had written, the grass withers, the flower fades, when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of the Lord endures forever. What those words mean is that compared to the staying power of God's word, each generation of humanity is just as permanent as grass and flowers are. They are here one day, but gone the next. But as Isaiah says, the word of the Lord endures forever. In Latin, the word of the Lord endures forever is verbum domini manet in aeternum. Maybe you noticed that the letters VDMA are on the covers of the bulletins this morning. At the time of the Reformation, many Lutheran soldiers wrote those letters on their shields before they went into battle against the armies of Emperor Charles V, who wanted to force all of his subjects back into the Roman Church. Now, if the Reformation had been centered on the person of Luther, then surely those soldiers would have written their name, had written his name on their shoulders, or drawn a picture of his face, or something like that. But the Reformation was not just about Martin Luther. It was about bringing the life and teachings of the Christian church back away from all the teachings that had been introduced that were wrong, and back with God's word. That's the second thing that we're going to talk about today. The need for the church to be reformed in the 1500s, and the need for the church and all of its members to continue to be reformed according to God's word. At the time of the Reformation, the true Christian church on earth had not gone away. It did not need to be restored. That true church was not the ecclesiastical organization headed up by the Pope in Rome. The true church was the body of Christ, the whole of believers, to whom God had given faith and the forgiveness of their sins through his word and sacraments. God also tells us through Isaiah, For as the rain and snow come down from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose, and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. Where God's word is present, verbally or sacramentally, Christians will also always be present, because God's purpose in giving us his word is to make us Christians. His word is the means through which God does that, and his word always succeeds. But at the time of the Reformation, the word and sacraments, even though they were present, had been obscured. And they were being explained in ways that deprived Christians of the full comfort that God wanted them to have from his word and sacraments. Baptism and the forgiveness of sins was obscured by the doctrines of purgatory and indulgences. The Lord's Supper was obscured by the sacrifice of the Mass. The Gospel in general was obscured by the teaching that if the Pope is not your head, then the fact that he is the Vicar of Christ that means that you cannot be saved. Even though the true Christian church on earth did exist in the years leading up to the Reformation, the Christian church was full of problems. Those problems were not from God. They were from men, from people who had mixed in their own ideas and doctrines with God's and were teaching them to the people as if they were all the same thing. Luther was willing to work and put his life on the line to change that, to make it so that people were given the forgiveness of their sins through faith in Christ with no strings attached, to make it so that when people faced death, they could be confident that soon they would be in heaven with God and all his saints, not in purgatory, suffering for those sins they had forgotten to do penance for. 
the Reformation was an extremely important time in the history of the church. We should all still say today that we are children of the Reformation, who follow in the footsteps of Luther and those who worked with him. But we shouldn't think that the Reformation is just a period of history, or that it was only needed at a certain time in history. Every generation of the church is in need of reform, not in the sense that things will always be as bad as they were in the 1500s, but in the sense that we, in this time and place, are just as capable of those who have come before us of introducing or turning a blind eye to human ideas that are mixed in with God's word. So we need to get into God's word for ourselves. We need to carefully examine, in light of God's word, the creeds and confessions that have been handed down to us. We don't do this because we assume that our Lutheran forefathers are wrong about something. We do this because when we say that we are Lutherans, we want to mean it. We want to understand what struggles the church has already faced in the past so that we can better understand and deal with the struggles the church is facing right now. And along with every generation of the church needing to examine itself and its teachings in light of God's word, all Christians need to be aware of the fact that we can and do stray from God in our lives. When that happens, we don't just need to be reformed. We need to be restored. The Bible does not talk about the Christian church needing to be restored at any time in history. But it does talk about Christians needing to be restored in their lives of faith all the time. Psalm 51. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Hosea 6. Come. Let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us, that he may heal us. He has struck us down, and he will bind us up. And Galatians chapter 6. If anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are faithful should restore him in the spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourselves, lest you too be tempted. God's law does not force us to sin. We take care of that ourselves. But God's law shows us our sins. As Hosea says, it strikes us down, and then the gospel binds us up. It gives us, again, the forgiveness and faith that was first given to us at our baptisms. It restores us to the confidence of God's love for us in Jesus, so that we can live in his church and serve him in our lives without fear. Without fear. That really can sum up Luther's purpose in nailing his 95 theses to the door of the church in Wittenberg, now over 500 years ago. Luther had studied the scriptures, and he had seen that they did not line up with so much of what the Roman Catholic Church was teaching. So Luther devoted the rest of his life to reforming the church, but he didn't restore the church. The church did not need to be restored. The church is not just an, an ecclesiastical organization. The church is all believers, built on the foundation of God's word, and word, and sacrament. For as long as God's people are waiting for Jesus to come back, he has promised us that his word and sacraments will always be with us. They will endure. And through his word and sacraments, Jesus has promised that he is with us restoring us to the joy and peace of his salvation. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Please rise for the prayer of the church. Everlasting and merciful God, we beseech you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to have mercy upon us and to hear our prayer. Look in mercy upon your church. Protect it and sanctify it by your truth. May your word be taught in its purity and your sacraments be rightly administered. Grant to your church faithful pastors who shall declare your truth with power and live according to your will. Send forth laborers into your harvest and open the door of faith unto all the heathen and unto the people of Israel. In mercy, remember the enemies of your church, 
and grant to them repentance unto life. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Let your protecting hand be over our country and over all who travel. Prosper what is good among us and bring to naught every evil counsel and purpose. Protect and bless your servants, the President of the United States, the Governor of our state, our judges and magistrates, and all in authority. Fit them for their high callings by the gift of your spirit of wisdom and fear, so that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. According to your promise, O God, be the defender of the widow and the father of the orphan. Relieve and comfort the sick and the sorrowful. Graciously help those who are assaulted by the devil and who are in peril of death. Be the strength of those suffering for the sake of Christ's holy name. Grant that we may live together in peace and prosperity. Bestow upon us good and seasonable weather. And bless us with upright Christian counsel in all that we undertake. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We especially commend to your care and keeping. This, your congregation, which you have bought with a great price. Keep from us all offenses, and bind us together in the unity of your holy love. Grant the little ones who are baptized in your name may be brought up in your fear. At your table, give to those who there commune with you peace and life everlasting. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Be merciful, O God, to all, according to your great love in Christ Jesus our Lord. When our final hour shall come, grant us a blessed departure from this world, and on the last day, a resurrection to your glory. Amen. You may be seated for the offering. <laughs> Dear friends in Christ, in order that you may receive this holy sacrament worthily, it is good that you consider what you must now believe and do. From the words of Christ, this is my body, which is given for you. This is my blood, which is shed for you for the remission of sins. You should believe that Jesus Christ is himself present with his body and blood, as the words declare. From Christ's words for the remission of sins. You should believe that Jesus Christ bestows upon you his body and blood to confirm unto you the forgiveness of all your sins. And finally, you should do as Christ commands you when he says, Take, eat, drink of it all of you, and this do in remembrance of me. If you believe these words of Christ and do as he therein has commanded, 
then you have rightly examined yourselves and may worthily eat Christ's body and drink his blood for the forgiveness of all your sins. You should also unite in giving thanks to Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for so great a gift, and should love each other with a pure heart, and thus with the whole Christian church have comfort and joy in Christ our Lord. To this end, may God the Father grant you his grace through the same our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We sing the hymn of preparation. <laughs> Give 
forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for the hymn. Because I would just as soon not share with you what I have been blessed with. For the distribution, the elders are going to distribute both parts of the sacrament. Now to make it a little easier for them, what that means is that everyone is asked to please receive the host in the palm of their hand, 
and then we'll all be using the individual cups for the blood. You may come forward in the direction of the usher.
We now continue with the hymn of thanksgiving. Please rise. Let us give thanks and pray. Almighty God and Father, we thank you for feeding us with the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. Send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one true God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for the hymn.
morning to you all again. So you did hear during the post-communion blessing what things would have been like without the microphone. So a necessary evil today. I'm glad we just had one little shriek when I let the thing get too close to the other thing. Thanks to those who did extra stuff for the service today, especially Ian, who is back there clicking away on the digital organ. And I do feel a little bad having us sing the chorale service on a day where I was essentially consigned to sitting and listening. But at the same time, I, since I was sitting and listening, I was listening. I was able to tell which of the hymns you all seem to know pretty well, and there were some. And I could tell that on the hymns that were less familiar, that by the third verse, they weren't quite so scary for you. And that's good, because the thing is, the hymns that are in the chorale service, even though they are musically maybe more on the challenging side of things, they are, oh, James must have woken up. They are a core part of the Lutheran hymn tradition. And so it's really good for us to know these things, not only for the purpose of worshiping together, but also for those times when we need a really good earworm. And you could do a lot worse than some of the hymns we sang today. <laughs> now, on Wednesday of this week, we are all invited and encouraged to go up to Prince of Peace in Taylorsville for our area joint reformation service. It's going to be Reformation Vespers this year. What that means, though, is that there's not going to be a service here or Bible class. And then next week, because Marta and I are going to be in Austria, there is also not going to be uh, the Wednesday night worship or Bible class for the next two weeks. But I will be here to conduct the service on the 3rd, and then Pastor Peel will come to preach and conduct the service when I'm gone on the 10th. And so I think that's everything I need to say. But Jim was going to make an announcement from Synod about a military monument that's going to be erected soon. Okay, you'll see in your...